Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Uh, now, politics and culture, the very, very essence of what we talk about on this programme, quite often it is in, uh, within a form of despair, maybe. Um, far more importantly, uh, we should try to understand quite what has given rise to the current situation politically and indeed where it's going to go in the future. Uh, so I'm delighted that my guest this week is Professor Matthew Goodwin of Kent University. Uh, you might know Matthew actually from books he's done in the past about populism, about the rise of pop national nationalism in, in Britain. And uh, indeed, his latest book is Values, Voice and Virtue. All will become a bit clearer on that front. Um, values, Voice and Virtue, uh, Matthew, that sort of, to me, conjures up very cultural things. Mm. Would you say that's true? Absolutely. And what that really refers to are these new drivers in politics, which I argue have delivered things like the UK Independence Party, the Brexit Party, the Brexit vote, and then, of course, this big realignment that we saw at the last general election in 2019. Yes. And so the book is really about saying, look, this is what I think caused all of that. And this is why I think a lot of that political turbulence is probably going to be with us for quite a while to come. And uh, we can break it down, but the, the, this is essentially what the book's about. I mean, I'm speaking very broadly here, of course, but um, one thing that's sort of becoming, well, certainly clear to me, and I know to many people watching, will be a sense that what they perceive to be really important things have apparently no outlet whatsoever in the public space. I mean, in a way, why would that be? Why would they feel that? Are they right to feel that? I think about 60% of the country would feel that way. About 60% of voters will tell me in surveys all the time, look, neither the Conservatives nor the Labour Party really represent people like me. And, you know, my argument is, look, if you look at the country today, you've got a large number of people who feel that their values how they feel about the country, how they feel about their identity, how they feel about Britain or England is not reflected in our uh, political class and, and, and its values. They feel they don't really have a voice in the institutions. They feel that the, the media, politics, creative industries, cultural institutions are disproportionately dominated by university educated, left-leaning progressives. And they also feel, I think, thirdly, that this new elite in Britain is increasingly looking down on other groups in society as being morally inferior, as being somehow um, toxic, as being, um, you know, not legitimate. Mm. And lots of people feel this way because, to be blunt, we do have a serious uh, problem in our country, which is that... Um, elite graduates from elite universities who tend to dominate many of the institutions are rapidly moving away from the rest of the country and how they think about these cultural issues, immigration, Brexit, uh, identity, diversity, uh, gender, uh, as we've seen in Scotland, among other areas, mm. and we'll come to talk about that. So when people look out and they think, look, people like me are not really in this national conversation, and if we are in it, we're being insulted or we're being derided as gammons or Karens or whatever. Mm. Um, to be frank, I think they have a point. Yeah. Wouldn't you, I mean, this is a matter of fact, is it not? I mean, in terms of, you do a lot of polling, don't you? And there's mm -hmm. a huge amount of research mm. going into this book. So basically when it comes to, you mentioned the domin dominance now of graduates. Um, this is just a matter of fact. Isn't it? I mean, if you take, for example, the media uh, and particularly print media maybe or television uh, essentially um, the, amount, the amount of people who are graduates often from private schools whatever it's hugely increased is it not oh, we've seen enormous changes over the last 20 or 30 years uh, academics sometimes refer to the rise of what they call diploma democracy mm. democracies that are basically dominated by the elite graduate class um, and you can see that in the House of Commons, uh, over 90% of MPs now belong to 
uh, the university educated minority. Mm. Uh, about half of them uh, pass through one of two universities. I'll let your viewers guess which universities uh, those are. Uh, the media is now more elitist than it was in the 1980s. The media is more elitist than it was in the 1980s, more likely to come from professional managerial families that also belong to the graduate class. Um, and it's the same story in the creative industries. So that if you are from the working class, if you are from the non-graduate majority, if your family do not come from the um, new middle class elite uh, that has gradually taken over the corridors of power over the last 30 years, um, then you don't really have a voice in the institutions or politics. You don't really feature in the national conversation, which is why actually I think those very same groups that dominate um, power in this country and other democracies um, were outflanked over the last decade. It's why yeah. they didn't see things like Brexit coming. It's why they didn't see things like the UK Independence Party or the post-Brexit realignment coming because you know, they have gradually drifted away from the rest of society. And the research shows this quite clearly. Mm. I mean, the new middle class graduate elite are more likely to associate with people from their group, are mm. less likely to associate with people from other backgrounds, are more likely to live in very concentrated areas of the country, are more likely to then send their children through the new university uh, based meritocracy, uh, are more likely to reap the benefits of this uh, globalized economy that we now uh, live in. Um, David Brooks, the American writer, once referred to them famously as the Bobos, the bourgeoisie bohemians yeah, who yeah. concentrate in the cities. But actually, today it's become a much greater source of power because um, they've developed a sort of collective sense of class consciousness around mm. their educational mm. backgrounds and qualifications. And that, I think, has actually become quite problematic. So what I'm trying to do in this book is to say, look, if we are serious about dealing with the drivers of populism, Brexit, all of the things that, you know, whatever your personal views about those issues, all of those things were telling us that millions of voters do not feel mm -hmm. like they're in this conversation. Now, we have a choice as we go into the 2020s. We can respond to those. Yes divides and say, let's get these people into the conversation, let's get them into the BBC, let's get them into the political parties, let's get them into the newspapers, or we cannot, and we can continue to keep their voice excluded, and that will have consequences. I mean, what do you think the chances of that happening are? <laughs> I'm, seriously, I'm not being facetious here. It's no, just, I'm... Uh, occasionally, there is a kind of reckoning and auditing, isn't there? And they sort of, you know, say, oh, actually, we should have more diversity of, of views and things. But it, it doesn't really happen. I think, was it... I think you mentioned in here, Justin Webb at mm. the BBC mentioned that someone like John Humphreys would probably not, he said, we won't have a John Humphreys for a long time. Yeah. Because uh, he came from a totally different yeah. kind of tradition sure. of journalism. But it's not only that. You look at the media class. We, we no longer have serious local and regional media in this country. Mm -hmm. So the pathways into the national media are basically going straight from one of the, the elite universities into um, into the yeah. uh, media uh, meetings. There is no real pathway for those kinds of people to come into the media anymore. And at the same time, the media has become dominated by graduates from privileged backgrounds. So the media has generally, as I show in the book and as the Reuters Institute at Oxford and others have shown, the media does actually on balance lean a bit further to the left oh, yes. uh, the, the, than, than perhaps it should do. And I think also that's reflected in just how, how we talk about the country. You know, even today as we talk, Peter, there was um, a survey that came out this morning showing that um, compared to our European counterparts, the Brits are the most likely to say they feel that the portrayal of British society in media is not accurate, mm -hmm. that it doesn't reflect the genuine population, that we see a much larger number of minority ethnic voices and um, uh, representatives in adverts, in television, in movies, and that essentially I think a large number of people feel as though they're being subjected to a political experiment rather right. than a genuine representation of what the country is and what it's about. I mean, you know, it might seem a trivial point, but in fact, that area of, for example, representation not just actually in, if for example, in ads, ads, commercials, mm. but also in general drama. Um, you know, it's almost like uh, pe people feel they're being 
gaslight it somehow, you know, in the sense that it's sort of, you know, they're t on the one hand told that there is this extraordinary, you know, there's white privilege, there's an extraordinary gap in, 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 in economic circumstances. On the other hand, um, they see this enormous overrepresentation. Can't make head nor tail of it. Well, no, I, no. I think people can make head or tail of it. I think they can see what's happened. I think mm -hmm. they can see that the what I call the new elite in Britain and other democracies mm -hmm. has has doubled down mm -hmm. and has embraced a belief system of radical progressivism. Yeah. And I think people can see that. I don't think I don't think voters are idiots. I think they can see that the people who are dominating the institutions have gone all in on this new belief system. And the, the evidence on this is clear. If you look at the surveys of um, the British population over the last three years or so, they show quite clearly that about 15% of the country hold what we might call woke or radical progressive 15, beliefs. Five, yeah, 15%. Yeah. But as, um, as I've already mentioned, those, that 15% is very influential. Uh, overwhelmingly comprised of undergraduate and postgraduate mm. degree holders, very wealthy, very urban, tends to be disproportionately dominant in the institutions. Mm. The most likely, by far, five times more likely than the average voter to share their views on social media. Yeah. On Twitter, constantly. It's the mm. FBPE crowd, the follow mm. back pro European. You know, we all yeah. know who these folks are, uh, but the research shows that they just see the country in a completely different way. Mm obsessed with this idea of historic injustice. We cannot move forward unless we spend endless amounts of time talking about empire. Obsessed with this idea that Britain is a, a, a very institutionally racist society. Absolutely no interest in looking at the remarkable progress that has happened in British society over the last uh, 50 years. Uh, far more likely to be consumed with issues like uh, net zero, climate change, yeah. environmentalism, uh, and much less likely, the least likely of all, to say they feel proud of their British identity, to feel attached to their British or English national community, and to say that those things are, in, are an important sense of who they are. So given that those individuals tend to dominate many of the institutions, it's no surprise, therefore, mm. that what we're seeing is this, um, what I talk about in the book, and um, uh, I, I know you've talked about this on, on this show before, but it's no surprise we see this very imbalanced approach mm. to who we are. So minorities are, are elevated, majorities are, are, are downplayed, and uh, we have a very um, specific, if not at times inaccurate, portrayal of who we are as a country. Mm. And I think voters can sense that. And so this value rift between the elite graduate progressives on one side and the wider non-graduate majority, or even graduates who might not have gone to Oxbridge or the Russell Group institutions, are sort of looking at this and just thinking, you know, this is crazy. I mean, this is not, this is not what the country yes. looks like. Yeah. This is a very different way of, of, of thinking about who we are. And I think people can see that, and that, that is partly, again, why they've been rebelling against, uh, against the political and media class. I think a very important point you make in this, Matthew, is that you, know, you, you, you say you went, you talked about Brexit, and indeed, you know, the Boris Johnson uh, uh, 2019 mm. ele general election, as these big kind of possible you know, outpourings of populism or a new kind of populism. Um, but these people you're, you're describing, this new elite essentially is what you're describing, mm. isn't it? It's a new, it's a new elite. Mm. Um, do you think that there's been any sense in which they've been kind of punishing people for those votes? I mean, that's how it sometimes feels, you know, that if you think of after 2016 and then obviously 2019, since then, you know, we've had the most extraordinary outpouring of all the issues that you have described in our institutions. I mean, with extraordinary speed and similarity, you know, museums, universities, all the rest of it, uh, decolonizing, um, looking at history again. It's almost like, you know, somehow or other, you know, I know it sounds fanciful, but somehow or other we're going to get our own back. You know, we're going to get the ground back. What we have seen, what we are living through, 
is what some of my American colleagues would call the Great Awakening among white graduate liberals. Right. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that in the aftermath of the Donald Trump victory in 2016, the vote for Brexit, that seismic mm -hmm. year, although it actually began a couple of years before, white, university-educated, um, economically affluent uh, liberals uh, have doubled down on their values. They've become more supportive of immigration and diversity. They've become more um, convinced that racial discrimination um, is, is a major problem in society. They've become more focused on the idea that rights for um, racial, ethnic and gender minorities have not gone far enough, that we should have this big reckoning. Uh, and they've also often done that while ignoring the context of national history mm -hmm. and identity. Mm -hmm. So for example, white graduate liberals in the UK often sort of don't really distinguish between the experience of race and immigration in this country yeah. from what's happened yeah. in, in yeah. America, yeah. which is a fascinating oversight. Yes. But, but, but this is really important because what's happened is, is and remember, only about 20% of Britain would describe itself as, as strongly liberal, right? So if you look at reliable surveys, the best surveys we have in the country, British Social Attitude Survey, only about 20% of people say, I'm strongly liberal, I hold these liberal values, but they, but they dominate many of the institutions. White graduate liberals have basically gone off a cliff in terms of their, their commitment, not just to social liberalism, but I would argue to, to increasingly radical progressivism right. and it, this is a different belief system mm -hmm. you know and I think we need to we need to understand why it's different because radical progressives are, are not liberal in the way that I think of liberals they have no real interest in individual rights they are overwhelmingly focused on fixed group identities you and I are white males that's generally not a great thing in this new moral mm -hmm. hierarchy but uh, our character, our individual traits are, are subordinate to, to fixed group identities. They are very dismissive of any objective research or empirical evidence that undermines the central claims of their ideology or of wokeism or radical progressivism, uh, anything that points to um, racism declining, mm. group disparities being about anything other than race, mm. they don't really want to, to hear that. And they are skeptical if not cynical of the things that have historically um, kept western nations together a shared sense of identity a shared sense of history uh, a shared sense of belonging mm. so radical progressivism as many other academics have argued francis fukuyama mark lilla among many others um, is very different from liberalism so i i think we have a specific challenge with this group and as they become more radical what they've done is not just drifted away from the rest of the country, but they've increasingly looked down on mm, other mm, groups mm, in society who, mm. who don't share their beliefs. Mm. And, you know, I've been influenced by some of the work recently that's been done in, uh, in, in, in the universities uh, by some renegades who have made the point that for the new elite, the source of status today is not money. Mm. It's not material resources. It's not even leisure time, which it used to be. Holidays were a sign mm. of status because the mm. working poor couldn't afford to go on holiday. Today, it's, it's their beliefs. It's luxury it's the, beliefs. It's, luxury beliefs. it's mm. the radical progressive mm. outlook. So mm. if you understand the vocabulary of that, if you understand cisgender, heteronormative, white guilt, white mm. privilege, mm. Uh, if, you, if you embrace that vocabulary and you signal it to others, it's a great way to derive status and a sense of moral righteousness mm. in society mm. uh, in a way that money can't really uh, yes. give you. Yeah. Um, and so that's really encouraged this, this tendency among the new graduate elite to look down on those who, who not only lack the same educational qualifications, because there is a bit of that snobbery around education, and I've been in the universities long enough to know it's there, but, but actually more fundamentally to look down on other groups because they are morally inferior on the basis of belief and ideology. And this is now, I think, becoming a key fault line in our politics in a way that it didn't used to be. No, I mean, um, I, I would agree. I and mean, you obviously, you know, you've written hugely about Brexit. That was the very first time I remember being surprised, actually, during Brexit, the level of 
condescension, the level of disdain shown by liberal Remainers. Not because not all Remainers were liberal, but you know what I, the kind of metropolitan, particularly here in London, you know, for people who were essentially therefore provincial, perhaps not certainly well not well educated, pro possibly rather dim, racist, gammon, all the rest of it. And that seemed to come out, you know, even on a generational basis, you know, like young versus old. Uh, that seemed to me to be, uh, have, I th have we stepped right? I don't remember this about British society. Of course, all. of course, the irony in all of that with that class snobbery, which you're absolutely right to point to, is that it would not be tolerated for a second if it were directed toward any mm. other group mm. in society. Mm. Mm. But because it is directed to mainly the white working class, it is considered to be acceptable. Mm. And what it reflects is that the new elite, the new graduate elite, are actually developing a shared sense of group consciousness, which is uh, not only reflected in their more positive attitudes and views of one another, but in their negative views of those who don't belong to their group. Mm -hmm. And that has become much more prominent. And there are a number of studies over the last two years that have shown how the new graduate elite tend to look down on others but those other groups don't look down on the new graduate elite. There's a real asymmetry in that. Oh yes, I, uh, I, I and you can see that quite yeah. clearly. So, so, so what you know, what one of the things in the aftermath of Brexit, and you and I have talked about this before, but certainly one of the things that uh, that I found out quite outrageous was the reaction to to the referendum. In that I didn't campaign to leave the European Union. Um, I didn't campaign to remain in the European Union. I wasn't particularly active on either side. But in the aftermath, my general uh, view was, um, OK, you know, people have voted for it. Yeah. Let's get on with it. Many of those views were expressed to me by you know, the people I grew up with and people in my family. So it wasn't really a big shock. But for the, for the new graduate elite, mm. it, it was a profound shock because mm -hmm. it violated everything they believed in. And it also underlined the extent to which, as I talk about in the book, I think it underlined the extent to which they no longer really understood the country they were living in. Yes, yes. Um, or indeed, it, what, didn't like it, maybe even. Um, there was definitely a lot of that. I mean, you can see that in the reaction among academics and journalists. Mm. You know, we've had you know, Jan Anganesh in the FT say, maybe the answer to Brexit is we just have less democracy. Mm. You've had academics write about um, the idea that actually we should, we should restrict voting rights to only people who can demonstrate they know something about politics. So the, 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 the instinctive reaction among the new elite has been to basically return to more elitist conceptions yes. of democracy, to say we should marginalise the masses because they don't know what they're doing, as opposed to interrogating the reasons why people voted for Brexit. Yeah. And as I show in the book, actually, there were two very coherent very rational motivations for doing that. One, people wanted decisions about the UK to be taken in the UK and for those people who are making the decisions to be accountable. That doesn't happen in the European Union. No. And I talk extensively about why that is the case. The European Union does not offer meaningful influence over executive office. It is not a genuinely democratic organization. That is perfectly clear if you look at it in detail. And the no. second motivation was immigration, mm. that overwhelmingly a large majority of the country, and many of them still feel this way, by the way, they felt that immigration was out of control and they wanted to lower the pace of immigration, not just control it. You talk about people being gaslit, you know, the narrative yeah. after Brexit is yeah. what people wanted was control. They didn't yeah. want lower numbers. Yeah, yeah. Wrong. They wanted lower numbers. They yeah. wanted numbers yeah. that around 100,000 a year, not 500,000. So, so the second motivation here as well, I think, remains in play in British politics for the next few years, decades to come. You know, um, the picture that you you paint in the book, it, it does have kind of consequences for people because nine times out of ten, the question that people ask, you know, on this channel is, what do we do about the situation? By that, they mean getting their voices heard. Mm. Now, if you if you describe a picture which is essentially about a class of people who are not necessarily, although obviously our MPs are more progressive than maybe once they were, but generally in the institutional life of the country, not to do with elections. These people all think roughly the same thing and they're drawn from the same class. How the hell is that ever going to change? So, so just one point before I answer your question, because 
there are going to be lots of people who read the book and say, well, we've always had an elite that's out of touch. What's, what's the difference? There is a crucial difference. The old elite were not countercultural. Right? They were pretty culturally conservative when it came to Britain's institutions, mm -hmm. British history, British culture, and a sense of shared values. You can go back, and even on the left of politics, as I talk about, you can look at the Clement Attlees, the Peter Shaws, the Tony Benz, among others, who basically accepted, even if they held very different political views, they accepted that national democracy was important, British identity and history were key, and that actually those things needed to be respected, upheld, and passed on to the next generation. Yeah. The difference with the new graduate elite is it is openly skeptical, if not cynical, towards many of those things, and in some cases, actively wants to repudiate yes. that shared sense of history and identity and belonging. And this is a crucial difference. It's a critical difference because it is sending a, a loud signal to many voters that actually the people who are dominating the corridors of power no longer really have that much of a vested interest mm -hmm. in upholding mm -hmm. the very distinctive identity, culture and history that they really cherish. Mm -hmm. And that's a key difference. So what do they do about it? Well, you know, I used to be quite pessimistic about the extent of division in British society. And over the last 12 months, I've actually found myself becoming remarkably optimistic. Oh, that's good. And the reason is because when we talk about voice and who has it, who mm. has a voice in British society, you know, if we were having this conversation 20, 30 years ago, well, we wouldn't have been having this conversation. Mm. Uh, the voice was provided by a small number of television channels, uh, dominant political parties, uh, and that was essentially it. What we've seen, I think, in, in very recent times, is the rise of new ecosystems that are forcing new voices and perspectives into the public square, mm -hmm. into the mainstream conversation. Whatever your views about them, you know, we have people on Substack, people on Twitter, mm -hmm. people on YouTube, mm -hmm. we have civil society groups, we have the little platoons, we mm -hmm. have um, all of the new television shows, we've got new television channels. So. What we're seeing, I think, is the flourishing of new voices and new perspectives, which actually gives me, gives me cause yes. for optimism. Yes. Do they dominate power? No. Do they control many institutions in society? No. But they are gathering momentum and building audiences in a way that wouldn't have been possible uh, 10 or 20 years ago. I remember a, a, good, well, a good friend of mine recently said to me, um, for the first time in history, we have a writing thinking class that is no longer dependent upon institutions. Yes. Right? That is mm. no longer mm. accountable to mm. legacy media, universities, whatever, to provide a livelihood. They can go on Substack, they can go on YouTube, they can build uh, their own embryonic audience. I actually think that's a very positive development. People might say, well, that, that's leading people out of the public square. Well, the institutions have failed to reform. Yes, They've failed. Yeah. And I, I feel especially um, strongly about this when it comes to the universities. Yeah. You know, if, if you look at how the universities have completely, in my view, uh, uh, failed to create space for alternative voices and perspectives, while often stigmatizing anybody who holds alternative views, Kathleen Stock, gender critical scholars, conservative scholars, historians who have a different view of Britain's empire, who say actually Britain got some things wrong but also got a lot of things right. And I know that you've mm. talked with Nigel Bigger on this show previously. Um, you know, those voices have been essentially shut down yeah, yeah. or chased out. Um, or they have to approach multiple publishers before they can oh, get yes. a book deal. Yes. Or in some cases, as with Nigel and, and, and others, Hannah Barnes, who's talked about the Tavistock Clinic, you know, in some cases, their deals are withdrawn or it's made quite clear that they, they cannot get their voice heard. I think uh, uh, it's Hannah Barnes, mm. 22 publishers she went through. Yeah, I which, think, which yeah, yeah, if yeah. these institutions were in touch with the public mood, mm, mm, would mm. not be happening. Why is it happening? Well, because publishing um, is uh, the most graduate heavy industry, 70% mm. uh, plus of people who work within publishing have at least undergraduate degrees, if not postgraduate, mm. and have often gone straight into Oxbridge, usually from private schools, and often come from very privileged backgrounds. So the criticism yes. that they don't really know 
the country or the areas outside of their group, outside of that mm. very small elite, actually has some credence to it. Mm. I think we need a much greater range of voices. Mm. I would love to turn on Radio 4 in the morning and listen to some local perspectives, mm. people who are mm. not part of the same mm. insular network, but if, you know, it's not gonna happen. So other institutions, other ecosystems will have to emerge. And uh, I, mean, I think you alluded to it, alluded to it there, uh, people gradually take themselves out of what was once the public space. I mean, you know, what, what they watch or what they read becomes less and less. I mean, you know, or they take on other things, you know, or they just, just absent themselves. Um, this has been an argument that's been going on a long time on a cultural level. People say, what should we do? Should we fight or should we just go and try and preserve the best of what they once, you know, what they once want? Right, okay, that's great. And, and I'm, I'm glad you're optimistic. Um, you know, any optimism is, is good. However, in the meantime, uh, there is an election coming up. Yeah. Um, and we have these parties, right? Um, we don't have, we have a few small parties. And we have the main parties. Um, should, people, should people bother to vote? I mean, you know, given that we have the situation as, as it is we've described, do you think they should? Uh, what should they do? What should they do at the next election? <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't, it's mystic sure. Meg time, but I mean, what in a way, what should they do? I, you know, this is something that I f think about all the time. I mean, you know, Peter Hitchens said you've got to let the Tory party go, for example, if you want to have a proper uh, conservative uh, alternative. I'm not suggesting that's necessarily what you want, you yourself want, but you know, how to break in an electoral sense, how to break this terrible kind of deadlock? Well, one of the things that the things we live with, the reality of politics in this country is the majoritarian system mm -hmm. and the barriers mm -hmm. to entry, as you know, yeah. are very high. Mm -hmm. And one of the ironies of Brexit is having left the European Union in order to give more voice to voters mm -hmm. who felt that they weren't in the conversation. We've actually remove the main pathways into politics for new parties yes. so the European mm. elections are gone. Mm. We only have local elections and we have general elections so it's very difficult for new parties to, to, to take off. That's why many people in and around Westminster will tell you that the only way forward for people who may feel as though their traditionalist values are not being respected, yeah. they feel they don't have a voice in the institutions and they feel that they're being looked down upon by this new elite, is to reshape the Conservative Party, is to essentially establish a new dominant faction within the Conservative Party, to say that actually, you know, and I talk extensively about this in the book, that, that, that liberal conservatism, Thatcherite conservatism, um, arguably was needed at that point in time, mm. but has got a lot of things wrong. Mm. As mm. we saw with Liz Truss, there is mm. a brand of conservative politics that is very oh, yeah. ill-equipped yeah. mm. and unable to meet the potential of the realignment that is sweeping through Western democracies. And so perhaps the only way forward for the Conservative Party is to partly return to the 2019 manifesto, which I think personally was a, was a good manifesto for the Conservative Party. But with Brexit having been done, it, it means the, the party has to find some kind of issue or message yes. that is capable of uniting that coalition together. And to be, to be, to be frank, that means dealing with the immigration mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Most people who voted for the Conservative Party in 2019 did not think they were voting for record levels of immigration. Mm -hmm. Most people who voted for Boris Johnson did not think they were voting for somebody who would massively liberalize the migration policy outside of the EU and even remove the requirement for British businesses to advertise jobs in Britain first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a conservative, yeah, no, right? No, no, no. There are lots of voters who I think perhaps out there are finally realizing that they were sold a bad deal. Mm. Uh, and so the Conservative Party, if it is to rediscover the realignment, and it's a big if, because I think there are lots of reasons to be cynical mm -hmm. about the Conservative Party. But if it is to do that, I think it has to somehow deal with this fact that many of its MPs lean much further to the cultural left oh, yeah. and yeah. much further to the mm. economic right than the vast majority of people out there in the country who are looking for an alternative. Because the, the reality, Peter, is there is no chance at all 
that the Conservatives will win London, the university towns, oh, no. uh, and the commuter belt at the next election. Mm. The only possibility for them going forward is the periphery, is the middle towns, the smaller towns, mm. the coastal towns. But that means Rishi Sunak and Swella Braveman and Kemi Badnock and others have to give those voters a serious reason for doing it. And it's going to take more than tax incentives and, and tinkering around yeah. childcare. Yeah. It's going to mean a serious sustained offer to cultural conservatives yeah, yeah. who are saying it's not that they're against immigration. They're just saying, I'd like lower levels yeah, of immigration. Yeah, I'd yeah. like 100,000, maybe 150,000, not 500,000. They're saying I'd like more serious effort and energy devoted to the left behind regions, not mm. just symbolic moves like moving civil service departments out of London. It means giving them a voice mm. in the institutions. It means standing up in the so-called culture wars. It also, by the way, means um, not, not, not giving up as much territory as the Conservatives have given up. I mean, one of the remarkable mm. uh, um, things that has happened over the last 10 years is that Conservatives have allowed um, uh, women's rights, the rights of children, uh, history and identity, to be rebadged as culture wars. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, this is yeah. how much they've retreated mm. in terms of political mm. territory. So I think many voters are looking for the Conservatives to take a stand mm. in those. And if Conservatives are looking for a serious example of, um, of, 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 of what, what perhaps I'm referring to, then, then, then a lot of that now comes from other democracies around the world where centre-right Conservatives have realised that we're no longer living in 1987. Yeah, yeah. You know, that actually conservatives need to use the state in some ways to intervene in, in these debates over free speech, free expression, um, gender, uh, the relationship between sex and gender, what we teach children, how we teach children. It's interesting actually because so if we take that example that hap you know, just happened uh, actually this week as we're speaking, we're speaking on a, you know, on a, on a Wednesday. Uh, of the Quran in the school, you know, and the boy being uh, suspended from school for scuffing a Quran. Whatever your views on the ins and outs of that, there is not the chance of any senior politician or political figure actually voicing anything about that. Quite often, people just need reassurance. Actually, mm. you know, it was like during the kind of, you know, the BLM statue felling and all that that period. Quite often, where I say like President Macron would actually say, "This is France. We don't do this," etc. You know, it was like pulling teeth to get anything out of the Conservatives here. And you sort of think, even even if you were just being opportunistic about it, why is it so difficult just to simply say, "We're on your side. We don't believe in this." There's nothing. It's like there's a real <laughs> reticence. Well, I give you another example. If you look at the debate over Scotland, mm, yes. I can't recall a single prominent conservative who actually approached the gender recognition reform bill from a perspective mm. that did not involve defending the Equalities Act. Yes. So the, the main point of opposition was that the SNP's bill would conflict with the Equality Act. It was not a conservative um, defense of uh, the traditional dividing line between men and women or it was not a it was not a, a an argument about whether we should be allowing children mm. to legally change their gender without any medical supervision uh, in such a, after a very short period of time I don't think there was a serious a, a single serious frontline conservative no. who made that no. argument and so I think voters are confused and I think to be honest a lot of voters are feeling um, quite understandably that the pace of change on these issues is so fast and there is so little leadership on them um, that they are um, that they are increasingly depressed and thinking about withdrawing from the political system because as we learn from America I mean you know the argument that nobody cares about culture wars is utterly ridiculous but um, as we learn from America there, there's one thing that that changes politics quite quickly and it's when parents realize their children are being politicized. And, oh, gorgeous, um, yeah. You can feel that issue beginning to bubble up in British politics. Yeah. I polled this uh, last week. Um, uh, should parents have access to what their children are being taught when it comes to um, race, sex, gender, uh, uh, 
uh, and those types of issues, um, seventy five percent of people say absolutely. It's it's not it's not even close. You look at the gender recognition reform bill in Scotland. These aren't 50-50 issues. Mm. These are 80-20 issues, mm. meaning 80% oppose what's happening and 20% support. Yet because our political leaders are very quiet on these issues, uh, people out there often assume that they're in a minority uh, and that they better not talk about these issues or they better not express their real views because they might uh, encounter you know, some real problems. But actually, it's, it's more often than not, they're 80-20 issues. Yeah. Do you, with uh, Scotland, um, that's a real defeat, isn't it, for, in the context of your book, uh, what happened there, that's a kind of real setback, straight defeat for, if you like, the progressive new elite, isn't it? Or it how depends. seriously do you... Do it, you it, it, it depends what lessons are taken from it. Now, if you're, if you're in the Conservative Party, there's a lesson there which is standing up against radical progressives on these issues can have major, a major upside. Um, you see, when people say these cultural questions don't matter, it's very disingenuous because what they'll do is they'll take a list of priorities for voters and they'll say, well, at number one is cost of living, at number two is the NHS, and at number three is um, climate change, and nobody cares about anything other than those issues, right? Mm. Wrong. Mm -hmm. When these issues are pulled into politics, when the supply side kicks in and you have entrepreneurs you have politicians who are willing to actually politicize them, as we've seen in Scotland, as we've seen in America, as we've seen elsewhere, Italy, then they become highly salient to voters mm. and they really do care about them. Mm. Uh, and we see that in Scotland. It wasn't that Scots felt that this was a very pressing issue. It's that when they were forced to look at it, they said, well, hang on, this is crazy. We can't ask 16 year olds, you know, we can't allow 16 year olds to legally change their gender without medical supervision. This is nuts. Mm, and 80% mm, said, mm. no, I don't agree with this. I don't think we should be doing this. Mm. But it took, it took that political battle to, to, to bring it to people's attention. Mm. And I think for conservatives, it depends what lesson they want to take from that. Yeah. You know, if they look at a Ron DeSantis, if they look at what's happening in the US, you know, the message from the US in my mind is pretty clear, which is that if you start talking about these issues, i.e what's happening to your children in primary and secondary school. Um, you know, that th this is a belief system. This isn't even grounded in science. Mm. This is a political belief system. Um, we are at the mercy of a new religion. And I know uh, you've had Andrew Doyle on your show, mm. and I think his book is excellent on this. Mm. Um, you know, let's talk about it. Yeah. If, if, they, if, if we actually had leaders and politicians willing mm. to talk about it and willing to say this is unacceptable, then our political debate would follow. But we don't have that currently. Mm. Uh, for, for, for understandable reasons, politicians are very, very nervous about stepping into this space. I mean, the worst thing in the world, right, in this current settlement that we have, is to be called a racist and a transphobe and, and to lose social status because of that. Like, I understand it's very, very difficult. You spend five minutes on Twitter, you can see. Mm. But if you don't care, mm. there's enormous power Mm. that comes with that. Mm. If, you don't, if you don't care about that, it's actually, it's about the issue. It's about the substantive importance. Should we be doing this to children? Mm. Right? Then actually people will begin to listen. Well, look, Matthew, thank you so much for talking about, your, about this book. Thank you. Values, Voice and Virtue, which is out the end of March, but you can pre-order it, of course, on Amazon and in all good bookshops, I imagine, as well, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, but um, if you could hang around, because we, we have our members and we have a couple of other questions for them. Absolutely. But in the meantime, thank you very much. Um, that's all for us. So what we're saying is this week, we shall see you next time. Okay, bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. 
If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.